Welcome to this webinar on arthmiogenic mitral valve prolapse, multimodality imaging and genetics. I'm Dr. Julia Grabsa, Editor-in-Chief for Jack Case Reports from Guy's and St. Thomas's in London, England. We have an incredible faculty today, starting with Dr. Lior Jankenson, cardiac electrophysiologist and director of the Inherited Arrhythmia Program at NYU, an author of the case Sudden Cardiac Arrest in a Patient with Mitral Valve Prolapse and Gene Mutations, Dr. Ritu Taman, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, also board member of the American Society of Echocardiography, who wrote the respective editorial. It is also a great honor to welcome Dr. Bob Levine, who, after modeling the mitral annulus with early use of 3D echo and demonstrating its subtle shape, redefined the diagnostic criteria of mitral valve prolapse and eliminated millions of cases with one manuscript. Bob is also identified early uh, mitral valve prolapse genes and has done work on papillary muscle ischemia in mitral valve prolapse. He's professor of medicine, Harvard School Medical School, and recipient of AHA Distinguished Scientist Award this year and ASC Lifetime Achievement Award that will be awarded in July in J- June 2021. Dr. Lawrence Ratsky, Professor of Medicine, McGill University and AC Imaging Leadership Council, uh, member and senior editorial consultant for Jack Case Reports, Dr. Jacqueline Joza, attending electrophysiologist and assistant professor of medicine at McGill University, Dr. Philippe Bertrand, attending cardiologist in uh, Z. Olds, uh, Belgium, and Dr. Jordan Strom, AC Imaging Leadership Council member and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. We will start with the case presentation with Dr. Leo Jagenson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia, and it's a real honor for me to, to be here with you. Um, so if I can share my screen. Chris, can you help me share the screen? Thank you. Okay, so this is a case of um, arrhythmogenic mitral valve prolapse uh, with some interesting genetic fi- findings. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna describe the case for you with our most interesting uh, observations. So this is the, this is the actual public publication. Um, so we have uh, treated a 37 year old female who collapses during a Zumba class. Um, she arrived to the hospital after having um, a pulseless um, collapse uh, while dancing. Um, she has a CPR on the field for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, EMS promptly arrives. Uh, bystanders provide the CPR initially. They shock her from VF. They give her one dose of amiodarone IV and they transfer her to uh, the ED, which is pretty close to NYU. So she was very quickly uh, transferred here. Um, Upon her physical examination, she's afebrile, blood pressure is normal, heart rate is 106, respiratory rate 18, um, 100% SAT on 100% O2. And on her physical examination, she's notably tachycardic with a, a, a two um, on six systolic murmur, best heard at the apex. Um, and that's that's about it in terms of, um, aside from, from mild hypokalemia, obvious uh, lactic, lactic acidosis and mitral troponinemia, um, nothing really um, nothing really sticks out. And so we're looking at her initial EKG. Um, and as you can see, she has she's in sinus tachycardia. Uh, what's interesting is you can see QT prolongation um, to roughly 516 or 520 milliseconds, which is quite usual uh, immediately post cardiac arrest, and, um, and so um, um, this is not surprising. By that time, uh, her sister comes to the hospital. She tells us that, uh, that uh, the subject had a known murmur uh, since the age of nine. She has hypertension. Um, she had possibly a recent flu-like disease, and she's on, uh, she's on, on antihypertensive medication. Aside from that, she's a vegetarian. She's an avid dancer. Uh, in terms of family history, her grandfather, paternal grandfather, had a 
sudden cardiac arrest at uh, the age of 30. The reason is unknown. She has a father with, an, with atrial fibrillation. She has one healthy sister. And she has two brothers in, uh, with which she's not in, uh, in contact. So um, um, we're seeing this EKG. Um, very limited uh, echo uh, in the ED shows a CF of 25%, probably an MR, possibly a mitral valve prolapse, and so she's undergoing pruning protocol. Uh, so this is uh, the echo that we are recording uh, once she's uh, in, in, in our unit. Um, what you can see is clear mitral valve prolapse. Uh, ejection fraction is roughly 40%. The, the mitral valve is, uh, leaf, leaflets are thickened. And I'm going to show you some um, higher res images. Uh, we can see very readily the mitral valve prolapse here. And with color, we see severe, severe MR, which is largely posteriorly directed. Uh, this is another view where we can see that the ventricle is actually dilated to about 5.7 centimeters. Um, and Flail, maybe uh, papillary muscle there. Again, with uh, with color, severe MR posteriorly directed. The RV, as we can see here, is probably mildly reduced in function, but again, this is pretty early. Uh, these are pretty early images. So path is normal. And this is uh, an EKG um, six days after hospitalization. We can see that the QT prolongation persists. So just to summarize for now, 37-year-old female uh, with a history of a murmur, hypertension, she's a dancer, she has VFRS, she achieves ROSC promptly, she's mildly hypokalemic on arrival, ECG shows um, prolonged QT, nothing on uh, CAT scan, uh, echo, 40% uh, ejection fraction, bileaflet, mitral valve prolapse with severe MR, and possible exposure to a viral illness. So what is the differential? Very wide, but we have. To... So one possibility is we're looking at the case with QT prolongation, prolonged QT. It could be either uh, representing long QT syndrome or acquired uh, prolonged QT. Could all be post-viral myocarditis, and of course it could be related to the mitral valve prolapse. So just quick perspective, we were about to publish this paper and resuscitation next month about QT dynamics after sudden cardiac arrest. And what we show is that most patients unrelated to etiology and unrelated to exposure factors have very long QT after um, cardiac arrest. And it's only those QTCs that are prolonged past the fourth day of hospitalization um, are predictive of future or longer term QTC prolongation. So that's not likely the diagnosis um, um, of choice here. And so just to quickly move to mitral valve prolapse, which uh, all the distinguished guests are going to talk about. So we're talking about a situation where there is bileaflet mitral valve prolapse with associated high risk features, including the female gender, moderate or greater mitral regurg, um, and other echocardiographic or imaging um, findings that will be discussed later. Um, and this is the MR images. So we can see here severe MR. And of note, we can see late gadolinium enhancement uh, at the posterior, at the base of the posterior leaflet, which is very typical for the malignant um, uh, form of mitral valve prolapse. Some more extensive late gadolinium enhancement on the inferior wall. At this point, we uh, elected to genetically test her with a very wide panel of arrhythmia and cardiomyopathy. And we found two variants, one in the LAMIN gene, LAMIN A gene, and one in the SVN5A gene. Uh, it's interesting that uh, both variants, I mean, both genes have been implicated in, um, in, in particularly um, malignant forms of mitral valve prolapse. And just a word about um, how to annotate these variants. So as many of you know, uh, we use a grid, a matrix, to annotate variants, whereas um, on one axis we have a spectrum of findings that can range from benign to pathogenic, and we judge them on a, on a grid of several uh, sort of central data clusters. Uh, one of the most important features is the population data, meaning how frequent is the variant in the general population. Another very important information comes from segregation data, meaning we're asking, 
what is the segregation of the phenotype in a family with the genotype in the family? Meaning does every case that has the actual manifested disease has also the, the variant um, or not? And then other layers of information come from computational models and functional data, which is largely in vitro, in vitro data. Unfortunately, in families like this, where we have very limited family members, it is very hard to derive information regarding segregation, which limits substantially the ability to, um, to correctly annotate these variants. And so we use different models, um, more advanced computational models, and this is the CAD uh, model, CAD score. CAD, CAD stands for Combined Annotation Dependent Depletion. Um, it is widely used as a measure of uh, deleteriousness of variants, and it can uh, very effectively prioritize ca uh, causal variants in genetic analysis, um, particularly in, in highly penetrant genes, like the SCN5A gene and uh, Lamin gene, which are very penetrant. And essentially, it uses a machine learning approach to um, label 60 different genetic features um, and compare these features between just random mutations and spots in the DNA that are highly preserved across species. And meaning that what that means is that the changes in DNA locations that are highly preserved are more likely to be malignant. And so based on that labeling, we can, we can basically predict or assign a, 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 a sort of a pretest probability for, to any variant um, as, as it relates to its potential malignancy. So with that approach, we show that the Lamin variant is very suspicious, has a very high CAD score. The SCN5A less so, but we have the uh, long QT phenotype, which helps, us, which helps us very much in annotation. So, um, so in summary, um, we have a patient with uh, the FRS, my, severe mitral valve um, regurgitation, bi leaflet mitral valve prolapse, and SCN5A lamin uh, mutations. Uh, the patient underwent mitral valve repair. We implanted a dual chamber ICD in her, and then follow up um, echo six months later showed a, showed a declining ejection fraction from 40% to 25%, which we believe represents her, her, her lamin cardiomyopathy, and she has no further um, arrhythmia. So the key factors here is to really use advanced tools for annotating variants. And I think what's the most interesting question is, here is when, when we're thinking about about mitral valve prolapse, we're thinking we're thinking about different risk factors, which are largely known to be associated with the clinical echocardiographic um, and um, and imaging um, findings that we've seen in patients. But what we're asking is, should we really um, analyze the genetic substrate of all patients with bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, or should we maybe? analyze those who present with mitral valve prolapse and, and uh, PVCs. So this is, I think, a very interesting and open subject for discussion. I just want to take, I just want to thank our, our, our great fellow, Asha. Uh, she's a cardiology fellow. She coordinated the case. Um, and my colleague, Yuval Yitan, who's a bio, bioinformatician from Mount Sinai. Um, so thank you. And with that, I'll move forward. Thank you so much for the wonderful case and presentation. Congratulations to you and your colleagues. Um, so, uh, by Dr. Tam. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to summarize the case for all us imagers who are on this webinar um, and to make some sense, put it together. So in order to have sudden cardiac death, uh, you need to have three things. And one is that you need to have a substrate and that substrate consists of some kind of it can be fibrosis, but what that substrate does is actually uncouple um, sites and the cell to cell adhesion can be lost. And we can see that on a macroscopic level as fibrosis. In addition, you need to have some kind of trigger, some kind of uh, pro arrhythmic um, 
trigger in this case it, we feel it was the channelopathy um, because there was this prolonged QT that was persistent even um, uh, four days or so after her um, cardiac arrest. In addition, you need to have some kind of transient event, initiating event. And we know from many um, studies that there, these patients actually, these mitral valve prolapse patients have very high catecholamines. And when um, the studies show that their just even baseline um, urine content is much higher in catecholamines, and when you exercise these mitral valve prolapse patients, they have higher concentration. So in this particular patient, we recognize that she was in the Zuma class, and presumably that was what increased her levels of catecholamines at that time. Now, this um, all these uh, things came together for the, like the perfect storm. And in this lucky patient, she had a witness cardiac arrest and survived. Um, so that is incredible. Um, next slide. I think that this case actually is very complicated because so many questions have been raised. The central, one of the central ones is, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it that this malignant mitral valve prolapse um, is a focal arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that you know comes secondary to these genetically mediated um, variant of cell cell adhesions coming apart and unrelated to the mitral valve prolapse, or does the mitral valve prolapse develop first? And then these genetic variants over time create this proarrhythmic uh, milieu. One, there were many questions as I read the case. One was, we know that the imaging modality changes the likelihood that you're actually detecting the, the seeing the mitral annular disjunction. And in a recent study from Italy, we saw that only 40%, even by CMR, are going to have their um, disjunction picked up. So we don't know exactly, um, you know, this imaging modality that um, was used, they, they didn't see it, but presumably could have been concealed because there are normally um, interspersed areas of normal tissue within patients who have MAD. It's not 100% mitral annular disjunction across or around the whole annulus. There just um, can be even in normals, just normal tissue. So there's that question that comes up. And then we do not know if we see it, what is the cutoff? We do not know. Um, and in the autopsy uh, studies out of Italy, they were seeing about a three millimeter on average um, mitral annular disjunction length. And there is some difficulty, when, especially on echo, because the prolapsing leaflets um, can go down and it's very hard to detect um, very small levels of MAD between one and four millimeters uh, because there's a shadow that occurs and you, you can't see it properly um, in mid systole. So, the other question that comes up is, what is the timing of MAD development apart for the MR progression? Because mitral regurgitation, of course, becomes a confounder in all these cases, because we know that mitral regurgitation in it of itself is a risk factor um, for sudden cardiac death, certainly severe. Um, and so it's not clear. Um, and then, other questions that came up in this case was that was there curling that you could see a little bit of curling of the inferior basal segment and that curling actually morphologically represents um you know that disjunction so but wasn't reported we um do see that the mitral valve leaflet thickness looked like it was 5 millimeters um or more um and I could not assess if there was a paradoxical systolic increase. 
in the mitral annular um, diameter, which is related to um, MAD if it is present. And then other echo uh, parameters like the pickle halvey sign uh, with this, which is increased tissue Doppler velocity um, was not reported. All in all, um, it just an outstanding case. Another um, question that came up is the fact that they're using um, this new um, interpretation of, of CAD. CAD has been around for a couple of years, it came out of uh, WashU. And what it is, is a mathematical transformation and takes the data and creates this plane, like in three dimension, and that plane separates causation from non-causation. So it's very binary. And in this case, interestingly, the the one uh, that creates the long QT was found not to be um, actually implicated, even though clinically uh, the long QT was. Um, and the other um, variant, the LMNA, was implicated by this CAD score. So it really highlights the difficulties um, that we have interpreting these genetic variants, because as we know, it's very difficult to go from a genetic variant into and correlating that as a risk variant. I'll stop there and um, let everyone else proceed and look forward to the questions. questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ritu. Um, we move to Jordan, Dr. Jordan Strom. Uh, my Thank, thank you. you, everybody, and thank you, Julia uh, and others, for having me. Um, so I'll be talking about the the imaging features, particularly uh, the cardiac MRI features of a arrhythmogenic and mitral valve prolapse. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide, please. So this is uh, this is not this particular patient, but this is a typical representative SSFP uh, image of uh, a long axis view. Um, and and here, and you can see a number of different features in this patient with bileaflet prolapse. Um, next slide, please. So, in particular, you can see the degree of the leaflet prolapse. You can assess the, the left ventricular ejection fraction, at least in this one view. Um, you can tell by the dephasing uh, that occurs at, at the uh, tips of the mitral valve leaflets there that there is mitral regurgitation present, though we, we can't directly quantify uh, that in this view. Um, you can also That. As, well as, local, bit more um, that. as well as local of the uh, basal myocardium. Next slide, please. So what is mitral annular disjunction? Well, this represents a discontinuity between the base of the mitral valve leaflet and, and the crooks or the, the superior aspect of the LV posterior myocardium. It was first identified by Hutchins in, in, in 1986, um, but has most recently been um, uh, there's been a lot more interest in this as a, a potential risk marker for arrhythmogenic uh, mitral valve prolapse. And it's thought that there's excessive mobility from the leaflets that leads to systolic uh, curling and ultimately mechanical stretch of the infrabasal wall and papillary muscles that can ultimately lead to fibrosis. Next slide, please. Um, and and to, to that point, A study on the top there is, is 36 patients uh, with arrhythmic uh, mitral valve prolapse and uh, known late gadolinium enhancement, 94% of which had systolic curling. Um, in this particular study, they looked at the length of uh, mitral annular disjunction, and that seemed to correlate well with the degree of, of, of curling. Um, and the degree of mitral annular disjunction was longer in those with, with LGE and also those with in the subgroup with sudden cardiac death. Um, in, in the, the study on the bottom, uh, this is a, a study evaluating 38 patients undergoing mitral valve prolapse in an uh, echocardiography. Um, and as, as uh, Dr. Tomman mentioned earlier, there's some question about what is the, the true prevalence of mitral annular disjunction on, on imaging. It depends on the type of imaging you do. At least in this particular study, it was found in about 55%, including 61% of women uh, and, and um, less so men. 43% uh, had mitral annular disjunction versus 12%, 43% um, of, of those had chest discomfort as well. So it's an interesting correlation. Um, 
well, well, we don't have a specific um, cutoff for saying that a, a, a degree of mitral annular dysfunction is, is significant. This particular study looked at a, a cutoff of 8.5 millimeters, and this was 67% sensitive and 83% specific for presence of NSVT on accompanying uh, monitoring. Next slide, please. So, um, LGE has been brought up quite a bit. This is um, fibrosis or scarring um, and that can be seen, and it's and it's typically seen at the base of the um, of of the posterior wall. Here you can see the most common form in, in this particular study was was the mid wall late gadolinium enhancement of that um, basal um, posterior wall. But you can also see patchy um, uh, uh, sub epicardial distribution and and a, a small pro proportion, 3.9% had sub endocardial LGE. Um, when you do see papillary muscle involvement, it tends to uh, predominate in the, the post remedial papillary muscle, though both can be involved. Next slide, please. Uh, so fibrosis is 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 seemed to be uh, associated with increased risk. So this study by Basso and, and colleagues looked at 43 adults with with mitral valve prolapse in sudden cardiac death. Uh, had contrast um, uh, cardiac MRI, which showed infrabasal uh, lake alinium enhancement in 93% versus 14% of controls, and 88% and had papillary muscle fibrosis, again, in a posterior medial predominant pattern. Um, yet another study looked at um, individuals with primary MR, about half of which had mitral valve prolapse, and this is getting at the, the question of, is it the MR or is it the, um, um, the mitral valve prolapse that seems to, to make a primary MR, uh, late gallon enhancement occurred in, in 30, about 37% of those with mitral valve prolapse versus um, only 6.7% 6 in those without um, mitral valve prolapse. Uh, VTVF occurred in about 7.7% of those with mitral valve prolapse and late gallon enhancement, um, and 2.7% um, of mitral valve prolapse alone and only 0.6% of, of those individuals with non-mitral valve prolapse uh, MR. And, and nor does this need to necessarily be focal fibrosis. So um, a study from our, from our institution looked at 41 patients with mitral valve prolapse, um, and those with ventricular arrhythmias had shorter post-contrast T1 values. Um, only about 36% had papillary muscle LGE, so suggesting that there may be diffuse uh, fibrosis involved as well. Next slide, please. And, and I don't want to harp on this, but there are, are several other imaging features and imaging modalities that could be used to um, identify those at increased risk. So there's the so-called Pickelhaube sign, which uh, represents the spike on the uh, lateral um, uh, mitral valve tissue Doppler um, um, during systole, um, and that represents sort of a tethering tethering of of the mitral annulus um, um, during systolic curling, and that represents the spike on, on this this German helmet. Um, and, and there's also sort of increasing in uh, interest in potentially using um, PET as a marker, an additional marker of evaluating inflammation. This particular study um, in a small group of patients correlated uh, MRI fibrosis with, with the findings of increased FGG uptake, suggesting that there's active inflammation in the process. Um, next slide, please. And, and just to say, we don't have enough time to be able to talk about all the imaging features, but uh, basal, other imaging features that may be suggestive of risk include a basal to mid uh, infralateral wall thickness greater than 1.5, paradoxical systolic expansion of the mitral valve, uh, mitral annulus. You can identify um, uh, mechanical dispersion um, and post systolic shortening, both as, as markers of increased risk. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to the panel. Thank you so much. So we started, if you please, I uh, will remind you to submit your questions on the chat box. So thank you so much. I will move to Dr. Bertrand and uh, Dr. Robert Levine to who will present their work on mitral valve prolapse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you everyone um, for being able to present this uh, this work, we, we briefly want to touch on something that um, we have been very intrigued by uh, during my time at MGH, and that is why the LV fibrosis in mitral valve prolapse always happens at that infrabasal wall. And um, this started with this, this very elegant study from Houston Methodist uh, Center, where um, they showed based on MRI data that in patients with MR with MVP, 
that the fibrosis always happened at the uh, infrabasal and posterobasal wall of uh, the ventricle, whereas in patients with non-MVP mitral regurgitation, it was more of a diffuse uh, fibrosis that was seen on the ventricle. And, and during my discussions with Dr. Levine about this, he, he gave me one of his many, many wisdoms, um, and he gave me this formula that he wrote on a paper for me, and he said, fibrosis is the combined effect of genotype, or at least the genetic predisposition to develop fibrosis, and a certain stress. And in patients that have the genotype to be more at risk of having arrhythmia, like the case that has been presented today, there is the element of stress that will that will determine whether or not the patient is, is going to develop fibrosis. And so then the question becomes, why does it always happen at that infrabasal uh, wall? Next slide, please. And when you look at this uh, transthoracic echocardiography image in the in the peristernal long axis view, uh, in an apical long axis view, you can you can see that there is a very visually already there is a very abnormal motion um, of that infrabasal wall of that infralateral wall below the papillary muscle, and and what you see is that um, from mid systole when there is the, the mid systolic click, something happens on both sides of that basal segment, and there is a there's a stretch going downward, um, which, which is what we see in mitral anal disjunction. Uh, you can see that there is a traction or a pull on that wall uh, downward to the to the annulus, but also there is a, a tug on the papillary muscle. And because of that mid systolic to late systolic tug on the papillary muscle, that basal wall tends to curl inward instead of shortening. There is a curling motion, as as has been described. And we looked at these cases, uh, a number of these cases that had combined echo and MRI data, and we looked at the strain patterns in these patients. And what we saw was that, um, and this was work done by Yasufumi Nagada, who is a, a brilliant uh, research fellow at, uh, at MGH, who's working with Dr. Levine. He has done a, a tremendous work on this. And, and what he saw is that on that basal infralateral wall, there is an abnormal strain pattern um, as seen by a, a double peak uh, on the strain curve, where you can see a, a systolic shortening that tends to stop at the moment of the mid-systolic click, then causes some kind of lengthening in that basal segment that, that occurs during the curling process, and with some post-systolic shortening. And uh, next slide, please. And we, we have been thinking about this pattern that we saw in a lot of these patients and that uh, was correlated to LV fibrosis in, uh, on MRI. And, and what we think happens is during late systole at the moment of mitral leaflet prolapse and the, the click and the tug on the papillary muscles, that there is a, a, a systolic lengthening on a segment that, that wants to contract but is inhibited on, on both sides by the annular expansion and by the papillary muscle traction. And then um, after release of, uh, of the pressure after aortic valve closure, this segment tends to relax again and, and has some post-systolic shortening. Next slide, please. And we saw that this in, in almost 100 patients from MGH and Cornell, um, that this pattern of abnormal strain in that basal wall, this abnormal stress on that, that basal wall, correlated with fibrosis and that both the fibrosis as well as that, that abnormal strain pattern correlated with arrhythmic events in these patients. So this is this is obviously something that is hypothesis generating and that uh, is not very clear yet um, how this is happening, but it, it makes a lot of sense to try to understand the mechanism of uh, fibrosis generation to see what kind of therapies, for instance, surgery, mitral valve repair, would alter this basal wall motion or this, this mechanical stress and could maybe prevent progressive fibrosis or prevent arrhythmic events. Um, but that was what I wanted to present uh, from our uh, research with Dr. Levine and with Dr. Yasefumi Nagata. Uh, that's that's great, Philippe. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you, uh, Dr. Levine, do you, do you have any comments that you want to add at this point uh, before we move on to the question and answer session? I just want to say, uh, just before you say that, the double peak sign is, is very interesting. It's actually been demonstrated by, by Frank Wiedemann also in the context of Fabry's disease uh, associated with fibrosis in that same segment and correlated with fibrosis on MRI. Uh, Bob, do you have any comments? Well, I, I think uh, this is part of the, this uh, amazing work by uh, Yasfumi and Philippe uh, is part of a general theme that's brought up uh, by both authors who spoke today, Dr. Jankelsen and, and Dr. Taman, uh, as the mechanical stimulus 
for both fibrosis and for arrhythmic events in sudden cardiac uh, arrest in mitral valve prolapse. So on the one hand, it's very intriguing, uh, and uh, these data showing mechanical changes uh, really have been shown by multiple groups uh, through throughout the world. First, beginning with the uh, concept of fibrosis, starting with Yu Chi Han when she was in Boston, uh, and then extending to Christina Baslow's group in, in Padua, and then mechanical dispersion by Francesca Delling uh, and uh, multiple uh, other people. So there's the fascinating relationship between abnormal mechanical stress induced by the valve disease and the presence of fibrosis in a localized fashion. And that's raising interesting mechanistic questions that are being explored by developmental biologists such as uh, Russell Norris in, in Charleston. Uh, in addition, there's the old data from Charles Gornick, an electrophysiology study from circulation in 1986 that uh, fascinating is that if you pull on the papillary muscles in each systole, you lower the threshold for inducing VTVF in an experimental model. So on the one hand, mechanics can induce fibrosis over time in a susceptible myocardium. On the other hand, it can provide that trigger that Dr. Taman was also talking about, that arrhythmogenic trigger for the event of sudden cardiac arrest. Thanks, Bob. We're gonna to move to the question and answer period. I'm going to, we, we have some prepared questions. There are also some in the chat uh, and some of them might be addressed during the prepared questions. I'm gonna start off with a question for, uh, for Jackie Josa, uh, our electrophysiologist. Uh, Actually, it's it's a it's a twofold question, which she's she's going to respond to. Um, uh, a significant percentage of patients uh, present, presenting with palpitations uh, pre with mitral prolapse have palpitations or ectopy. In the olden days, we just said the palpitations were so were part of that so-called Barlow's or mitral valve prolapse syndrome. But now we're going to we're starting to see that they're more nefarious than just the pal benign palpitations that people get. How often should we be, should we be performing Holter monitoring, and is there any particular PVC morphology that we should be more worried about, Jackie? Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. I mean, I think the and thanks to the panel. I mean, it's been a great discussion so far, and I think you know things are going to tie in really nicely here. Um, so you know, the ECG is so important. How do we differentiate a malignant from a more benign arrhythmia in in MVP? Now, certainly, you know, non-sustained VT and also frequent complex ventricular ectopy, you know, like ugly polymorphic looking triplets may be an early signal of the presence uh, of fibrosis. And I think it may, in fact, precede the findings of SCAR that we can uh, appreciate on MRI. So some of those, you know, Kaplan microcurves that you showed, Philippe, uh, you know, demonstrate no LGE, but maybe it's just that we haven't waited long enough for that LGE to appear. Um, and those patients still have the ventricular arrhythmia. Now, you know, you have on one hand, you have fast non-sustained VTs and certainly sustained VTs. Um, anything that's that's fast, greater than 180 beats per minute, uh, has been associated with long-term mortality, and that's independent of other risk factors. Um, that's the Rochester group who showed that recently. And uh, you know, it's it's not even just how fast the arrhythmia is. In my experience, and that of the literature, it appears that the PVCs originating from the posterior papillary muscle. Um, are often implicated in those with malignant mitral valve prolapse. And certainly, you know, the anterior pap muscle and the anterior and the um, posterior mitral valve annulus have also been implicated, um, but, but much, much, much less commonly. Um, so, you know, here you're seeing this ECG. Uh, you see uh, here, um, this is a, a young woman or a middle-aged woman, sorry, she had a sudden cardiac arrest and it was clearly from malignant mitral valve prolapse syndrome. And while she was in the CCU being resuscitated, you know, this is her ECG, and we see a few isolated ventricular ectopic beats. What's really nice here is that you see that beautiful T wave inversion inferiorly, you know, that tipped us off right away. Uh, that I, I knew what was going to find what we were going to find on the echo, but also the ventricular ectopy itself is, um, you know, when you look in V1, it's uh, there's a tall R wave. And uh, suggesting that it's coming from the left ventricle, and then there's a superior axis, or or that PVC has negative-looking um, uh, uh, PVC in 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 two and three, and suggesting it's coming from the bottom, right? So the posterior pap muscle. And uh, so so this lady. Oh, and what, one other thing I wanted to mention here is the fact that it's very delayed PVC. So these are delayed after depolarizations that are triggering the event. Um, so it's it's a very nice example of uh, a malignant mitral valve prolapse ECG. Uh, can we have the next slide? 
Uh, and so, you know, I, I just wanted to mention one thing, you know, when we talk about Holter monitoring, you know, I think it's important perhaps maybe once a year, but maybe every six months in a patient who has maybe a higher risk category. I'd like to hear what others on the panel think. Um, but if there's a higher risk category, for example, a middle aged woman with high liquid prolapse, T wave inversions, you know, you might want to do that more um, frequently. Or, or if you have a suspicion that they're a greater risk, maybe a referral to an electrophysiologist for an implantable monitor. Um, you know, so this is another patient uh, that we, um, and Philip, again, you're going to like this one, uh, that we, we took to the lab. She's a malignant mitral valve prolapse. She, we, we implanted an ICD in her and she had recurrent arrhythmias despite uh, medication. And you can see this is one of our uh, EP studies. And what we're seeing here is uh, this is sinus rhythm. So these are sinus beats. It's just at a faster paper speed. And this is a PVC here. And these are the surface leads and underneath are the electrograms. So we have a multi electrode catheter that's just sitting on the posterior papil papillary muscle, the area of interest. And you can see these repetitive in the green arrows, you can see these repetitive um, mechanical looking artifacts, very clean occurring right where, uh, you know, mid systole is right where that mitral valve that prolapse mitral valve is going to close. And we see this beautiful, this artifact. And it essentially, it's the systolic click. And um, you know, the, the the red arrows here are looking at Purkinje potentials and these low, you know, ugly fractionated potentials that are likely the site of interest for ablation. So it's all kind of tying in, I think, with the fibrosis that we're seeing that you that you demonstrated so nicely in the previous slides. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so, you know, we start to ablate in this area, and you know, she just goes uh, into VT polymorphic VT. And our catheter is sitting here on the on the posterior papillary muscle, and you can see beautifully in this intracardiac echo the bileaflet prolapse. Next, uh, next uh, image. Next slide. Yeah, and then she goes off to the races. Next slide. And so uh, we see, you know, that it wasn't good enough just to do endocardial ablation, but we had to actually go to the epicardium where we see this beautiful. You can see on the left image uh, this redness. That's all scar. So it's epicardial scar because we're, we're epicardial and uh, we burned in this area quite significantly. And, uh, you know, that seemed to be successful for now after about uh, one year follow up. So, you know, um, it's just interesting how everything, I guess, ties together uh, here. So I don't know if I answered too much of your question, Lawrence, but. Uh, no, that, that was that was great. Uh, just uh, I, I want to bring in one of the uh, audience questions as well as, as I move to the next one. Um, when you see a lot of PVCs, non-sustained VT, if you've actually diagnosed some genetic abnormalities, uh, is that an indication for surgery? Or should you, as one of the people in the audience suggest, uh, asked, is there a role for prophylactic beta blockers or antiarrhythmics? And when I was young and naive and I saw these PVCs, I thought this was kind of just a strain on the ventricle. It was bordering on decompensation. But now we've heard so much more. We know so much more. So first question is, do we give prophylactic antirhythmics or beta blockers? And when we see this, is th should this push us right now with our current existing data to think about operating sooner? Yeah, so that's a great question. Again, um, you know, clearly we're missing a lot of information with the beta blockers, you know, uh, Although they might reduce the, the, the frequency of ectopics, I don't think that they're going to rid of, get rid of it completely. And there is data that, you know, that doesn't do very much. Uh, there's a little bit of data on flecainide, but again, you know, it's, it's still unclear. Um, I put all my patients on with malignant mitral valve probes, all of them, you know, the several that I have um, on, on easy going beta blocker. And they seem to be doing well. Um, um, uh, there, uh, are, there are, there uh, are, uh, for the surgical, for the surgical aspect, aspect of the question. Um, there are case reports that describe uh, complete resolution of ectopy and resolution of those inferior T wave inversions after the mitral valve repair. Um, so, you know, but that being said, the presence of ventricular arrhythmia is not considered an indication for mitral valve repair. And that, you know, I, I'm convinced that surgery must work, though, in a certain percentage of patients, but there's likely an ideal time to act in a very narrow window, outside of which there might be less benefit. Um, and perhaps a substantial proportion of patients have already missed the window uh, once a significant ventricular ectopy is present. I don't know what you're just in a quick follow-up, just, just yeah. in a quick follow-up, uh, another question from the audience is, and, and obviously you don't have the, the answer for this, does ablation or PVC suppression modify the long-term risk? Uh, so when would you do it? It sounds like you would do it for secondary prevention. Correct. I would implant an ICD in these patients because, you know, when you do go for ablation, likely these will occur and the studies do show that. Uh, there was a, um, 
uh, the Mayo Clinic showed this very nicely about two years, two, three years ago, that the arrhythmias still recur. Um, and so these patients need a defibrillator for sure. Um, no, not all mitral valve prolapse patients, but you know, I guess that's a million dollar question. Who needs the ICD? Okay, Julia. Um, thank you very much. Uh, going to the imaging perspective, a uh, question from El, uh, Dr. El Talawi from Houston. Uh, so the diagnosis of uh, mitral lanular disjunction on echo at end systole could lead to uh, some error, uh, overestimating the mitral lanular disjunction extent due to the rolling of the posterior leaflet, the top of the posterior left atrial wall at end systole. So do you think that uh, MAD could be diagnosed during diastole on TE or maybe high resolution transthoracic echo or CMR? But that's an open question to the panel. I think it's an excellent, I think it's an excellent question, <clears throat> and it has certainly come up. Um, and like Carlos is saying, um, what we end up measuring um, may be the depth of the mitral valve um, leaflet prolapse, which may or may not be part of the MAT. And because we're seeing this kind of shadow um, uh, and we're measuring the size of this shadow on the posterior left atrial wall. However, um, a, one interesting um, element is that the morphofunctional abnormality of mitral annular disjunction <clears throat> is this paradoxical mitral annular um, in, increase in size, and you were seeing that in mid systole. And so by measuring in diastole, while it's a clear uh, separation, you, you are separating that from the actual consequence of um, MAD. And really that is uh, not been looked at. Um, and so we don't know what that incidence is. MAD, we know across the globe between the Japanese population, the Chinese, and uh, European, it's, you know, the frequencies 10 to 20%. But again, um, this imaging uh, would be very interesting to go back and see in the diastolic frames if you could see um, the MAD. And that's great. I would add also that most, most of the normative data that we have about uh, MAD has been in, in systole. And so um, it's a very interesting and intriguing question and whether or not um, the degree of MAD at end diastole versus end systole. Can I just ask, Can I just ask Jerry for you to follow up? For you to follow up. Uh, uh, obviously, we can't do MRIs on everybody. Uh, should we be doing MRIs on everybody with classic mitral valve prolapse or Barlow's? If we see mitral annular disjunction, if we see the pickle hoe, who do you, who do you decide if we're unsure whether it's severe or not? Who do you decide uh, on on who gets the MRI, or how do you decide? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And, and the reason that there are not guidelines about this is because there's really, it's a little bit unclear about what do you do with the information that you find on an MRI, particularly if, if you have a patient who's relatively asymptomatic, they get an MRI for another reason and it shows this. It's really hard to know what to do with that kind of information. I, I, I certainly think that in, in patients who have aborted sudden cardiac arrest without another clear etiology who have bileaflet prolapse, it's very reasonable to get an MRI to look for fibrosis, but also to look for other uh, causes of, of a potential arrest. So, so the MRI accomplishes multiple purposes uh, in that regard. Um, and, and certainly people with, with complex ventricular arrhythmias, um, which originate from that uh, posterior papillary muscle, I, I do think it's reasonable in those cases. But how often we follow often this, we follow whether or not you repeat the MRI over time, uh, whether or not uh, you use the inform MRI information to then refer for ICD, I think all of these are ongoing questions, and hopefully, um, hopefully we'll have more information in the future to help guide us. But, but it's, it's, just, just more, just, more, just more, more general. Who with mitral valve probes and MR gets an MR, uh, gets an MRI in your center? Uh, well, our, our center uh, does a lot of MRIs, um, but so I would say we do it uh, uh, largely um, on, on a good group of people. I would say uh, we get referred referred for both VT VF PVCs 
Um, but, but, but also we, we also get a fair a number of people with bileaflet prolapse for whom there's palpitations or some ongoing concern that there may be arrhythmogenesis. And, and so, um, we, we, we get referred for that purpose as well. So I, I don't, I don't think there's a clear answer really, but, it, but it comes down to your institutional availability and, and also, um, the, the, um, your ability to be able to, to resolve these issues. These issues. In addition, in addition, I just like, like to add just that, like to add that, add that um, on CMR, on CMR, you also get T1, T1, which has been shown by Delling um, to have some prognostic um, um, information, uh, which is more of a diffuse kind of maybe early fibrosis that um, would precede LGE seen on CMR. Um, and also that um, out of Mount Sinai, they're looking at PET and have found that in certain types of patients, they're seeing PET uh, light up before the LGE. So we're, as our tools get more refined, I think that this question will become better elucidated. That's fantastic. So a question uh, from the imaging perspective, because I see uh, constantly on the comments, risk score and risk score. So a question for Dr. Levine. Um, first of all, we discussed this, the um, signs of M MV mitral valve prolapse, MAD, and a uh, few new indices. So uh, there are old data from Dr. Maurice Serrano that they describe uh, uh, that sudden cardiac uh, death risk is associated with reorganization class and ejection fraction. So do you think that now as we go along and we have these imaging indices such as fibrosis, MAD, the genetics, practically that they will supersede these older uh, predictors and we will have a kind of new risk score from these parameters. What do, could you predict for these patients? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great, great that's question. A great question. Um, I think that the more we understand about the mechanism of fibrosis and arrhythmogenesis in MVP, the better we'll be able to predict it and prevent it. It's very sad that we still see patients uh, who have uh, uh, frequent ectopy and we don't have an indication, let's say, even for doing an MRI in them. Uh, and unfortunately, we also sadly see people like this patient uh, who had no premonitory arrhythmias, but who just present with sudden cardiac arrest. And I've seen that uh, Dr. Avinu Sell in our group has been following patients like that. And it's, it means that we don't understand enough about this process in a way that we can predict who will have the risk of sudden cardiac death and need prevention, including uh, implanted defibrillators potentially. So I think what's called upon, I'd like to issue a call for action for you know, national and international groups is a prospective study that includes MRIs done because we don't know what the indications are uh, to see who will develop uh, arrhythmogenesis in the future and sudden cardiac arrest in a way we can then translate that into prevention. I think that applies both to uh, the kind of uh, medical and electrophysiology pre prevention and also to study in greater detail prospectively whether surgery um, is preventive or whether fibrosis at the time of surgery uh, blunts that benefit. Thanks, Bob. I, just before we close, I want to address one question to Dr. Jenkelson, which is, uh, who should we order genetic testing for in mitral valve prolapse? Yeah, I think that's a that's a fascinating question. Um, so, you know, one kind of paradigm that you can think of is, is you know, you can think of mitral valve prolapse um, as a having an arrhythmogenic phase even before having a structural phase meaning that, you know, even with the absence of late gallium enhancement on MRI, you could have an arrhythmogenic phase, just like we see that in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And so I think that for, um, well, my threshold for, for ordering a genetic test would be basically any case with sudden cardiac arrest. And I claim, although that's not in the guidelines, that, you know, there is a cut for genetic te testing for cardiac arrest without explanation and that's that's obvious but for me the finding of mitral valve prolapse and severe MR does not explain cardiac arrest per se and so I think there's room for genetic testing in that setting it could be 
many patients, but I, I really think that's the situation. Um, if I may, just uh, one more thing, because I, I saw some questions here on the, on, the, on the thread. There's a question about sports with microvalve props. So yeah, competitive uh, sports is prohibited. With, with MR and by leaflet microvalve prolapse. And um, for those who are, in, who are interested, I, I recommend reading the 2015 Testa uh, statement. Um, so that's an important intervention to uh, prevent further deterioration. Thanks. Uh, um, just, to, just to address one question. Uh, so this recession is being recorded. It will be up probably middle next week uh, after it's edited. I want to thank again, a really had an outstanding panel, a standing discussion. We heard about a very thought provoking case, brought out many aspects that we haven't considered routinely when we deal with patients with mitral valve prolapse, which is a condition that we all deal with really quite frequently. We learned from renowned international experts about all aspects of mitral valve prolapse and in particular, a more and more malignant form. For me, it's always a treat to, to hear from my mentor, uh, Dr. Robert Levine, particularly when he talks about what he's so passionate about, what he's devoted so much his career towards. We also heard of one of the themes of the questions, uh, because the, the answer to many of the questions is we don't know, we don't know, we don't know, um, is that uh, there are so many unknowns in both the investigation and guiding therapy and clearly more information is needed. We've also heard from some of our experts here that we need registries, we need prospective registries, then we need prospective trials that cut across all the cardiovascular subspecialties. So we really have to work together. We hope that you'll take home some of the lessons of the webinar and apply them to your practice uh, right away uh, and start addressing the questions. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Grapsa wrote uh, on, on her behalf also, I want to thank everybody. And she is going to attempt to have follow-up emails uh, for some of the questions uh, in the chat box. Thanks and have a, a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. Take care. Thank you, thank you so much.